Welcome to Alchemical Science. I'm Jordan, an open source researcher who investigates science that's either usually very old, very new, or very esoteric. This is the fourth part in my Decrypting the Plasmoid Unification Model series, but if you haven't seen the first three parts, that's totally fine. They do provide a lot of context to the importance of the angles, ratios, and numbers that I'm going to show in this video, but uh, each video is also quite interesting and possible to follow standalone too, and I'm going to be very well off track um, to just what the Plasmoid Unification Model is. I'm providing a lot of context and trying to build up to what it is. So in the previous parts of the series, I showed how we can find the origins of these numbers uh, that form the basis of the PUM, referenced by the Greeks, the ancient Sanskrit texts, the Bible, uh, our systems of time and imperial measurement, and the dimensions and ratios of the sun, the moon, and the earth. And I've been skirting around just directly explaining the PUM head-on, as I say, um, because frankly, I'm unable to explain it directly yet. I know what it is. Uh, it's a system for converting matter to energy and energy to matter. And we can explore the relationships between time, space, geometry, the cosmos, the elements, sound, and everything else uh, through harmonic mathematics and geometry and understanding the cyclic and multidimensional nature of numbers. A lot of it still needs to be clearly explained, um, but there is something, many things, very profound about this plasmoid unification model, and we're going to find out what they are one step at a time. So this time, our focus is on ancient architecture. To get the ball rolling, the question I pose is, is there evidence that ancient civilizations knew of and frequently utilized what has variously been called vortex-based maths, Sanskrit or alien maths, Pythagorean maths, uh, harmonic maths, multidimensional maths, all of these different names? The answer is yes. It seems overwhelmingly evident that they knew of it, and it was used to calculate and design uh, many of our ancient megalithic structures, such as the pyramids, temples, and cathedrals, as well as all sorts of other things. And the reason why this is also becoming a more relevant topic to explore than ever before is that Malcolm Bendel's plasmoid thunderstorm technology is based on geometry ratios and harmonic numbers that we're able to find evidence, evidence of uh, all over the ancient world. So this concept of the Molten Sea Arc Atomic Reconstruction Technology is derived from, uh, as its name suggests, uh, the Molten Sea in the Temple of Solomon. And the water-filled bath which was used to charge the Ark of the Covenant uh, with plasmoids. The technology is also based on the legendary thunderbolt weapon of Indra, uh, the Vajra, which Indra used to save humanity. And we see a very similar weapon in the hands of Zeus as he is hurling thunderbolts. And the design of the Vajra, uh, this thunderbolt weapon, was Malcolm's inspiration for the two spheres, creating the opposite, uh, opposing vortex differentials occurring in the thunderstorm generator. Another important aspect of the generator are the transitions between the spheres and the pipes, which are 51.84 degrees. And 51.84 degrees is the angle of the face slope uh, of the Pyramid of Khufu. And 5184 represents time itself on the plasmoid unification model uh, at its double 2592, uh, 25,920 being the great year of the procession of the equinox. Randall Carlson worked with Malcolm on a lecture series, and there are several parts in that series which delve right into the Vajra, uh, Solomon's Molten Temple, the Molten Sea Arc, and how they relate to the technology a little bit further. Uh, Randall's also been on a couple of podcasts talking about the tech uh, and the ancient links, and I'll link to his interview with Danny Jones below where he gets into it a little bit. And this is just the very tip of the iceberg of the historical references we can find showing that the ancient world was riddled, riddled uh, with evidence that they all knew the secret of doubling and tripling. What do I mean by the secret of doubling and tripling? This is the secret behind the mathematical construction of the plasmoid unification model, vortex-based maths, and evidentially the core of the science of mathematics used by many ancient civilizations, or at least a part of that core. In a previous part of this series, I showed based on Malcolm's PUM and the work of Jamie Buterf, how these harmonic numbers like the dimensions of the sun, moon, earth, and our systems of time and measurement, and the traditional A432 Hertz concert pitch tuning in music could all be easily found at a table uh, that could be structed, constructed uh, using only doubling and tripling. Jamie called this the table of most harmonic numbers, and I'm going to have a lot more on the music theory 
and Pythagorean tuning side of those things soon. But I took this idea further already myself uh, when I was inspired to map the numbers out on a chessboard. And I studied this doubling and tripling sequence, as well as the halving, fifthing, and pentupling sequences, and their interactions quite deeply using the harmonic chessboard concept. Uh, and I still have another video to come on that as well soon, with significant updates to that idea. After boasting that video uh, on the harmonic chessboard, I got an email from a researcher that I hadn't heard of before, Edward G. Nightingale. And he told me that this doubling and tripling sequence that I'd found there was actually Plato's lambda sequence, uh, something that Ed has been studying himself for 25 years. And not only has Ed been studying this doubling and tripling sequence that he knew from Plato's Timaeus as the lambda sequence, but he'd been applying it too, uh, quite prolifically. Ed has quite honestly, in my opinion, already rewritten the very foundations of mathematics, architectural design, uh, astronomy, and ancient history, among a few other things. And it just boggles the mind to try and comprehend it in full, much like Malcolm's P. Wim. But I'm going to start to introduce Ed's profound rediscoveries by showing you the same harmonic numbers found in the PUM, found again in Ed's reverse engineering of the lambda sequence and his descript decryption of the Giza Plateau and the Great Pyramids. So to understand the true significance of the plasmoid unification model as an energy to matter or matter to energy conversion device, we need to continue to build a picture, uh, understand the context of what it is and how it can be utilized. Essentially, we need to learn this harmonic mathematics and geometry from the ground up, and it's not taught in any traditional school or university that I'm aware of. Ed Nightingale's template is a masterpiece in its own right, uh, but it also offers us a highly significant body of work that can help us get there in understanding how the plasmoid unification model was constructed and how we can utilize it. Ed provides us with what I believe is conclusive evidence that both the Greeks and the builders of the pyramids knew of this science and these numbers, uh, and he's able to precisely mathematically reconstruct the Giza Plateau using only a compass, a carpenter's square, and the lambda sequence, or the secret of doubling and tripling. So I'll briefly summarize the introduction to Ed's work on the lambda sequence, sacred geometry, and the reconstruction of Giza Plateau here. And you should once again see the startling cohesion with Malcolm and Marco's theories, and further evidence that there is something profoundly interesting to all of this. Squaring the circle, the relationship between the square and the circle. We begin with a simple geometric solution to squaring the circle. And I've seen a few methods of squaring the circle, and they're pretty cool, but Ed's method is certainly the most simple and curious method that I've encountered so far. So Ed happens to be a master woodworker who has worked on many complex major architectural projects, uh, working with world-renowned architects and clients, and he uses these methods in his calculations. So it does work, uh, and it serves its purpose, as you will see. So first we draw a circle. Any circle, um, just any size. We divide the diameter of the circle into nine equal units, so that we now have a nine by nine grid. To find the approximate area of the circle by squaring it, we simply need to draw in an eight by eight grid square, having equal units with the nine by nine grid square as shown here. The eight by eight square consists of 64 unit divisions, the area of 64. The circle encased by the nine by nine square has an area of 63.6428 units of the same size, based on pi 3.142587 or 22 over seven. The eight to nine ratio between the circle and the square shows us their harmonious relationship. According to Ed's work, this eight by nine ratio was used prolifically as part of a template for ancient land management and for the survey plan for the blueprints of the Giza complex, as well as many other significant sites. And we'll explore this idea further when we come to mapping the plateau a bit later in the video. The eight by eight square grid, the template temple, Let's now move on to explore the 8x8 grid itself. This is where we come to talk about the doubling and tripling sequences, the biggest secret and the most profoundly simple part of the system of mathematics, which was self-evidently employed by many advanced civilizations around the ancient world. This is what Ed refers to as the lambda sequence, as hinted at by Plato in his book Timaeus, but we could refer to it simply as the doubling and tripling sequence if you're confused about what it is. Plato places the two number sequences on each leg of an inverted V, uh, the shape of the 11th letter of the Greek alphabet. 
Plato claimed that God used this sequence of numbers to create the cosmic soul. And as we've already started to explore in the previous parts of the series, uh, the Bible, the Sanskrit scriptures and histories, and the Baha'i scriptures uh, also make much the same claim in a multitude of cryptic ways. So it's apparent that a lot of people knew this doubling and tripling secret, uh, secret uh, if we consider history over a broad time scale. There's a lot more background to what the world word lambda itself means, uh, the etymology and various historical and modern definitions of the Greek symbol of the lambda. Um, but I'm going to just leave that all for now and get into the basics of how it is applied. Applying the lambda sequence to the template. Now this begins in a similar way to my harmonic chessboard concept. <clears throat> in my idea, I place the numbers within the squares and then use the square divisions and the checker divisions uh, to place the doubling sequence vertically and the tripling sequence horizontally. Ed does exactly the same thing here, starting by placing the one in the top left corner, the origin, and then doubling on the vertical axis, the Y, and tripling on the horizontal axis, the X. The difference with Ed's method to mine is that he places the numbers at the points or the coordinates rather than within the squares. And he has a good reason for this though, uh, which we'll see as we start to explore this configuration. He uses the lines of the grid on a coordinate plane, and this is essentially um, to be able to see the cohesion of the geometry presented along with the numbers. So we can fill in the coordinates or points of our coordinate plane uh, with harmonic numbers, multiplying the initial numbers plotted on the corresponding points of the horizontal and vertical axes together to obtain their results. And as in the chessboard theory, and in the most harmonic numbers table I've explored previously on the channel, these numbers obtained from the interaction of the doubling and tripling sequences give us eight octaves of the baseline frequencies of each note in the A432 uh, musical tuning pitch scale. Um, and I'll show you in another video that we can actually condense this into a full method of Pythagorean tuning that corresponds with the string in physics, but well, that's coming soon. Um, so, for example, if we take 432 hertz, uh, this is the frequency of the note A. And if we look one point below 432, we see 864. And 864 hertz is also the frequency of the note A, but one octave uh, above. So the interval between each number going down the vertical planes is always an octave, double or half. If we draw a scale on the diagonal from any of the octaves of C, the the interval between the frequencies of these notes is a ratio of 3 to 2, or a decimal ratio of 1.5. So in Pythagorean tuning, this interval is called the perfect fit. So this is a scale of perfect fifths, uh, shifting up through the octaves as it goes. And as I say, uh, I'm going to do another video soon, soon that shows the chromatic scale, the 12 notes, and uh, all sorts more on that stuff. So this is the first part to what Ed refers to as the template. Interestingly, he notes that the root word for template is the word temple. And leading into the topic of our next section, the word grail or graal is an early French word uh, used by the Templars, meaning step or coordinate. So temple, graal combined, meaning the temple coordinates. So next we will see what information we can find in the coordinate plane of the template to aid in the reconstruction of the Giza complex. The overall plane of the square is referred to as the coordinate plane. Uh, the points to which we've plotted our numbers be can be considered coordinates. So each harmonic number on the grid is plotted to a specific coordinate. First, let's consider the number 432. 432 is a very significant number. Uh, as we've discussed earlier, it's the traditional tuning pitch for musical instruments, but it's also represented in many other ways in our solar system. For example, 432,000 miles is the radius of the sun. The origin of the word radius itself is related to the sun. The radius, uh, the radius of Ra, uh, and in Greek, helios, helical, uh, equals radius plus forward motion. So if we now draw a straight line connecting the point of the 1 uh, to the point of 432, we obtain the 345 Pythagorean triangle. It has an angle of 53.13 degrees, uh, which just so happens to be the angle of the slope of the Pyramid of Khafre, uh, the center pyramid of the largest three. The 345 triangle is also fundamental to calculating the resonant frequencies of the elements using Malcolm Vendel's toroidal model. 
We can draw in a second 345 triangle, continuing the 53.13 degree angle down to reach the point 186,624, a number which is remarkably close to the wavelength of 1 hertz in miles, uh, as shown here. Next, we'll explore the relationship between imperial inches and Egyptian cubits, uh, which can be found in the template. So from there, we will see how both of these measuring systems were evidently used to design and construct the pyramids of Giza. And these specific harmonic measurements obtained from the lambda sequence were clearly intentionally encoded within the complex of Giza and the pyramids to be discovered by later generations. It's not just that there are is a clear conversion factor between the imperial and cubit systems of measurement, it's also evidential that they were both used simultaneously in the construction of Giza, as Ed shows. So now let's draw in another scale through the coordinates to gain some further information. This time we take two points, the first seven intervals down the side on the vertical axis from the one, and the second seven intervals across the top on the horizontal axis from the one. If we draw in a vertical 45 degree angle line between these two points, it will cross through eight number coordinates, uh, which also creates seven intervals on the diagonal. And each interval here musically represents a perfect fifth between the frequencies of the note, uh, as we mentioned previously. If we take seven by seven by seven, equaling 343, we can already ascertain the base length of 343 feet of the pyramid Menkare the smallest of the three pyramids. But we can find some more substantial information if we fractally divide the scale down into seven further intervals, containing 49 intervals and 50 notes total. So 432 would be the 21st interval in this case. To consider the value of the interval between 432, the note A, and 288, the note D, the step or coordinate preceding 432 on the scale here, we simply need to subtract 288 from 432. So the answer is 144, which we will of course already find as the number plotted between 432 and 288 here. And we may remember the harmonic number 144 as representing the light on the Pleasantwood Unification Model 2. It's an important number that comes up a lot there. As our full square unit is now divided into a further seven units, to find the value of each of these further divisions, we just take 144 and divide it by seven. So 144 divided by seven equals 20.571428. This number may not seem significant yet, but according to the currently accepted data from Petri and others, 20.571428 is exactly the number of inches in the ancient Egyptian unit of measurement, the root cubit. So 20.571428 inches, uh, 144 divided by 7, equals 1 root cubit. We can also get there by dividing 432 by 21. And again, it will equal 20.571428, the root cubit in inches. And just as with 7, 21 is a significant number that can allow us to precisely reconstruct several other base measurements of the uh, pyramids in the template. So if we first multiply 21 by 21, this equals 441. 441 is the measure of the base length of the pyramid Khufu in root cubits. So 441 times 20.571428 it equals 9072.022 inches. So if instead of dividing 432 by 21, uh, we multiply 432 by 21, we get 9072. And here we found another measurement of Giza, uh, this time 9072 inches being the measure of the outer base length of the pyramid Khufu. Now one last time, if we take 432 again, but this time we subtract 21, this equals 411. And in 411, we have the base length of the Pyramid of Khafre in royal cubits. So what is a royal cubit as opposed to a root cubit, the one we mentioned earlier? I'm very glad you asked. Just as the builders of the pyramids used both inches and cubits simultaneously in the design and construction of Giza, they also used both the root cubit and the royal cubit simultaneously. And so in this case, the root cubit and the royal cubit were used as two different units to describe the same measurement from different perspectives for different reasons. The root cubit is, as its name suggests, um, the root or the base measurement derived directly from the template uh, through the interaction of the harmonic numbers, as we've shown. 
Calculations for the design of Giza based on the Lambda sequence and the simplified template could be quickly and easily made using the root qubit. The royal qubit, uh, on the other hand, is an adjustment of the root qubit, used to correct the base harmonic numbers for real-world building purposes. The reasoning behind the necessity of a corrected or adjusted qubit uh, is suggested by the theory of music by Pythagoras, um, as it's understood uh, currently, uh, who it's said he found he must adjust or refine the tuning of the 12th perfect fifth intervals at seven octaves in order for it to sound in perfect tune to our ears. In other words, his mathematical values uh, brought him to an approximate value for seven uh, octaves that he then refined afterwards to reach a another real true world value. So a similar approach seems to have been used in the case of the qubits, the, roi the root qubit and the royal qubit. The royal qubit is an adjusted value used to refine the tuning of the measurements used for actual building, actually building the structure. The root qubit shows us how these measurements can be mathematically derived from the harmonic doubling and tripling sequence. Ed has decrypted the mathematical relationship between the root and royal qubit, showing that the royal qubit equals the root qubit plus uh, one four hundred and fortieth part, so twenty point five seven one four two eight plus zero point zero four six seven five three one four hundred and fortieth part uh, equals twenty point six one eight one eight, which is one royal cubic. So going back to the base length of the pyramid Khufu again, now we can see how the root cubit and the royal cubit are used together more clearly. 1 root qubit equals 20.571428 inches times 441 equals 9072 inches, uh, which is the outer base length of Khufu. And 9072 inches divided by 440 equals 20.61818 inches, 1 royal qubit. So although the initial calculations are made in root qubits uh, derived directly from the lambda sequence, the adjusted calculations for the real-world construction would be converted to royal qubits. And Ed's also decrypted the relationships between the other qubits, the canonical qubit and the geographical qubit, uh, as shown here, but I'll be keeping this video to an overview, and we'll explore the different qubits and their uses more deeply in another future video. Utilizing the lambda sequence and the harmonic numbers derived from it, uh, Ed shows in his book that gives a template how we can finish mathematically reconstructing each of the pyramids. One of the most significant angles we find is the face angle of the pyramid Khufu, which is 51.84 degrees, uh, which we can derive from the phi division of the circle and the radial division of the circle by 13, um, all of which we'll briefly cover shortly when we explore how the sphinx is positioned with the template, which has a lot to do with the circle and the spiral. So 5184 is the number representing time on the plasmoid unification model 2, uh, and it's precisely double 2592, 25,920 being the cycle of the great year, and also uh, negative 259.2 degrees Celsius being the melting point of hydrogen, protein. So uh, again, as stated on the PUN, note the further correlations between the systems and units of measurement shown here uh, that have often been considered arbitrary uh, as soon as the harmonic numbers are considered in the matter. So I won't go into the full reconstruction of each pyramid in this video just for the sake of time to keep at a reasonable length, but I encourage you to go and check out the Giza template, um, Ed's book. So there's many updates and refinements to Ed's research since he published this book in 2014, but it still serves as an excellent resource to understand the fundamentals. Instead, we'll skip ahead and show how, utilizing the template and the accurate base lengths and angles which Ed has derived for the pyramids, we can now begin to reconstruct the ground plan view of the Giza Plateau. Reconstructing the Giza Complex on paper. Just a quick note for those who are skeptical of the data we're presenting so far, Giza is one place, and I have this from multiple authorities, where independent verification is just not allowed. The problem this presents is, of course, that official data that no one has the ability to verify, technically speaking, does not fit the criteria for scientific evidence. And if you're following any of the ancient history powerhouses like Randall Carlson, uh, you'll see that this is an issue that's rather common in the world of ancient archaeology and architecture. But it's really, really a problem at Giza. Anyway, so the first structure, the Pyramid of Kafra, the center of the three main pyramids at Giza, 
uh, which we're going to place first, will set the scale for the overall plan based on its base length on both sides of 411 royal cubits. We'll consider Kafra to take up exactly one full square on the grid, one ninth of the full diameter of the circle, uh, just to ratio scale. So one full square unit now represents 411 royal cubits. From this, we can ascertain the dimensions of the full plan by multiplying 411 royal cubits by 9. We get 3,699 royal cubits. And so this is the number that establishes the overall dimensions of the template. As we noted, the number 432, the product of 27 and 16 on the x-axis, is on the coordinate uh, making up the 345 triangle. The angle of this triangle, 53.13 degrees, is the slope angle assigned to Kafra. Now Kafra can be positioned on the center line of the 9x9 and the 8x8 square grids, six positions from the bottom. Its bottom center line located at the coordinate 648. Uh, note the coordinate value at the southeastern corner of the square of Kafra is also the number 432, uh, the sum of 54 on the y and 8 on the, uh, sorry, 54 on the X and 8 on the Y, uh, as shown here when we make further subdivisions of the scale, uh, as we covered earlier. The second structure we'll place, uh, the Great Pyramid of Khufu, has two base lengths, which we'll determine earlier uh, in inches and feet. And so we'll also utilize imperial measurements to determine the spacing for this second structure based on the position of the Pyramid Khufu. As we showed earlier, Khufu has two base lengths, uh, one taken from the corners, 9,072 inches or 756 feet, and one taken from the center lines, which is 9,000 inches. One way to plot Khufu, and I must add the disclaimer that Ed has actually found uh, at least one other method in his updated version of his work, uh, which isn't released yet, which he believes may have been the probably the primary method, uh, but this method is still valid and it shows something interesting, so it, it works also. He's just found more. So anyway, the first way he's discovered for now, uh, we measure out 375 feet to the east from the base of Kafra to plot the distance of the center line of the base of Khufu from Kafra on the vertical axis. So this means it will be 378 feet from the outside base which extends 72 inches further than the center base length, as we discussed. So 378 feet is also half of Khufu's outer base length, uh, 756 feet. On the horizontal axis, the center line of the base of Khufu is located 432 feet from the northern face of Kafre, the extended outer corner then being located 429 feet from the northern face of Kafre on the horizontal axis. Another note here is that if we add 375 and 378 together, the two dimensions we determined earlier uh, to plot Khufu, this will equal 753 feet. And if we multiply 753 by 12, uh, we get 9,036 inches again. So divide 9,036 by 360, and this equals 25.1 inches. And 25.1 inches uh, being the measure of the sacred cubit, another cubit there in inches. And obviously we'd need to convert and scale our measurements using the uh, methods we discussed previously. Um, but using the calculations above, we can now position the pyramid Khufu using the pyramid Kafra as the reference point as shown here. And its base lengths, as we previously noted, are 9,072 inches from the corners and 9,000 inches from the center points. The difference in the corner to the center point length of 36 inches on each side will not be visible on the scale that we're drawing the template though. Oh, by the way, uh, 432 feet in inches is 5184. Uh, 5184 representing time on the plasmoid unification model and being double 2592, uh, 25,920 years being a full cycle of the precession of the great year. The zeros here simply represent order of magnitude. Uh, there's still another harmonic relationship between any corresponding harmonic digit sequences, regardless of the difference in the amount of zeros in the number or the placement of the decimal point. Things get a little more complicated as we progress to plot the third structure, Menkore, the smallest of the three main pyramids. Uh, and this video is already reaching the extremes of the uh, length I try and keep it, 
So I'm not going to go through this process, but needless to say, Ed has decrypted it and the instructions are available in his book. And he's going to be releasing some videos soon that show um, some more of his work too, which I'll be linking to. To give you a bit of a further overview of how we finish mapping the Giza complex though, the satellite pyramids are positioned using a variety of methods, which Ed has decrypted and goes into in his book. And they're not arbitrary methods. Uh, they can be mathematically and geometrically verified as being correct using multiple points of reference. And they seem very likely to have been the actual methods used in the original design of the Giza plan. These methods to plot the positions of the satellite pyramids include calculations using a circle of half the diameter of the original, uh, which we can then use to index and indicate the radial divisions of the circle, such as 8, 9, and 11. By using the phi division of the circle, the golden cut, uh, and the golden rectangle, based on the Fibonacci series of the numbers 13 and 21 divisions of the 34 by 34 square, Ed shows how a Fibonacci spiral is drawn in relation to the circle. The Sphinx is positioned on the template using the Fibonacci spiral, uh, the Sphinx being situated near the center of the spiral within the 21st square of the 8x8 eight eight grid, counting back from the bottom right corner. But this opens up another whole can of worms, and you may by now be seeing why it really can't all be explained in the length of just this one video. The Sphinx on the ground is precisely aligned to its counterpart in the sky, uh, the constellation Leo, and its lion asterism with the brightest star in it, uh, Regulus, located at the chest of the lion. And this is the regulator uh, of the measure of time. In this case, the regulator is the circle 360 degrees. The Sphinx is the point from which all of these celestial measures will be viewed. It's through this alignment that we can see the relationship between the Sphinx on the ground plane of Giza, viewed from the eastern sky, indexing with Leo on the ecliptic. Orion is reflected in the mirror plane of the night sky, uh, indexing the three belt stars of Orion with the three main pyramids on the ground, and mapping the spiral trajectory, uh, the path, we can see known as Barnard's Loop, which emanates from the Great Orion Nebula. The image demonstrates the relationship between the spiral and the circle. So Orion, the origin, orient, ordinate, uh, charts the trajectory, the path and the distance on a spiral from its origin. Leo and the star Regulus, uh, the regulator, tracks time, uh, the procession of the equinoxes, the zodiacal cycle, and the helical motion. Oh, and uh, as we promised, to check that this is all legitimately working, and Ed's not just making it up, uh, we can overlay our template on the most accurate satellite imaging from QuickBird, certified as being accurate within four inches, and see that our mathematical reconstruction so far does indeed fit the satellite data. The full evidence of the accuracy of this is again outlined in Ed's book, The Giza Template, uh, available on Amazon. Ed's also overlaid the template on Google Earth Pro uh, and accurately, and hopefully this is something that we can show sometime as well. So this shows us another drop in the water to the extent of Ed's full decryption of our solar system's trajectory and the motions of other pr prominent uh, celestial bodies such as Sirius, the Pleiades, and uh, others using the template uh, that he's recovered from Giza. If the Giza complex is a structural codex of ancient knowledge left for us to intentionally rediscover, as Ed claims, then of course the knowledge it contains had an important intended purpose. I'm going to delve into all of these more advanced applications of the template and the doubling and tripling sequences in future videos, uh, particularly in music theory. It's my next one's coming up, as I've mentioned. So what we have here from Ed Nightingale, though, is a 25-year momentous body of work, uh, which from all my research so far, corresponds with startling precision to Malcolm Bendel's plasmoid unification model. As I've shown previously, Malcolm's Sanskrit, or alien mathematical theory, is synonymous in many respects with Marco Rodin's vortex-based mathematics, and Ed's work, work uh, also corresponds with and supports both theories. I'm already a direct student of mathematics of Malcolm and Marco, and as all good things come in threes, I have a feeling that I'll also be a long-term student of Ed's. Uh, I see their research combining to form a master key to be able to help us recover and truly learn and apply the lost ancient sciences. In the next part of the plasmoid unification model series, uh, we're going to start to really explore the relations and the meanings of the numbers and the geometry in the PUM itself, focusing more on the model. 
uh, and how the model can be utilized. And I'll also be publishing more on the template in future too, and working closely with Ed to continue to more deeply understand his work and continue to integrate and share it into what I'm presenting. So thanks for watching and stay tuned for more. Coming soon.